Audio Lecture for World War II. Key Concepts. Failure of Collective Security and Peace. The Treaty of Versailles, 1919, did not create an enduring peace, as we have been noting for the past couple of units. The severe punishment of Germany due to Article 231 resulted in conservative German resentment against the dictated peace, the diktat. The League of Nations also failed without the United States and the USSR as members. The League did not have the will nor the support to maintain peace. During the 1930s, the League stood by while aggressors like Germany and Italy invaded other countries and violated provisions of the Versailles Treaty. Paper agreements of the 1920s had few enforcement mechanisms either. The Locarno Pact that we discussed in a previous unit of 1925 Germany and other European nations agreed to settle all disputes peacefully with the Locarno Act, and it was never enforced. It gave Europeans a false sense of security about the future. The spirit of Locarno was no longer relevant once Hitler took power in 1933. Its provisions were not enforceable. The Kellogg-Briand Pact, or the Kellogg-Briand Peace Pact, of 1928 was also a failure. 62 nations signed a treaty proclaiming, quote, war is illegal, unless for purely defensive purposes. The treaty lacked enforcement provisions, however. Hitler later claimed that his aggressive military ventures were for defensive purposes, so they did not actually violate the Kellogg-Briand Peace Pact. Key Concepts The Great Depression resulted in the rise of fascism in Japan as well as in Germany. Japan invaded Manchuria in 1931. The League of Nations condemned the invasion but did little by way of sanctions. This is largely because the League of Nations had no teeth to enforce any sanctions without big power nations like the United States and the Soviet Union belonging. Japan pulled out of the League altogether, so no longer felt that it needed to adhere to the policies of the League. Hitler withdrew from the League as well in 1933 and secretly began rearming Germany. Germany started to get ready for World War II several years before the rest of Europe did as a result. The London Economic Conference in 1933 also failed to achieve any international cooperation in remedying the depression that was happening throughout Europe. The United States played a major role in undermining the treaty. The conference's failure sent a strong signal to Hitler that the democracies in Europe lacked the organization or the will to address the international economic crises. Key concept. The Italian invasion of Ethiopia began in 1935. Again, another fascist dictator, Benito Mussolini, was in charge of Italy. Italy gained a measure of revenge for its earlier defeat by the Ethiopians back in 1896 with this invasion. 500,000 Ethiopians died in the war compared to only 5,000 Italians. The League of Nations imposed sanctions on Italy for doing this but did not include oil on the list of embargoed goods. No attempt was made to prevent Italy's navy from using the Suez Canal on its way toward Ethiopia either.
France and Britain were not willing to press Italy because they needed Italy's help in keeping Hitler in check. This is before Hitler and Mussolini formed the Axis Alliance. Britain, in particular, sought to appease Italy to end the crisis and only place an embargo on the sale um, of British weapons to Italy. In 1936, the League lifted its sanctions on Italy completely. Hitler was further encouraged that the international community lacked the will to enforce peace with this move. This picture is Italian artillery in Ethiopia in 1936. Key concept. The Spanish Civil War between 1936 and 1939 will serve kind of as a dress rehearsal for Hitler and Mussolini. Generalissimo Francisco Franco, a fascist, sought to overthrow the Republican government in Spain. Franco sought to restore power of the Catholic Church and destroy socialism and communism in Spain. A civil war erupted between the fascists that were known as the Philanagogists or Royalists and the Republican Loyalists. Mussolini and Hitler supported Franco, a fellow fascist, and used the conflict as a testing ground for their militaries. Italy sent 100,000 soldiers to Spain and the Italian army gained practical experience in warfare that will ready them for World War II. Germany's air force, the Luftwaffe, bombed Republican-held cities in Spain. The bombing of civilians in the city of Guernica prompted Pablo Picasso to paint his masterpiece, Guernica, in 1937. We looked at this piece in the earlier Age of Anxiety mix. It shows you the anxiety, the destruction, and the feelings of loss that are associated with this move. Franco won the war largely because he had the support of Germany and Italy, and he imposed a fascist dictatorship in Spain. Help from Germany and Italy was a major cause for the fascist victory, and Britain and France officially recognized Franco's government because at this point, they were not willing to go to war to try to restore the Republic. They were based in an appeasement mentality mode to try to avoid war at all costs. They had their own financial, economic, and political problems at home to worry about. The League of Nations once again proved ineffective. This time, it did not lift a finger to help the Republican Loyalists against Franco. They were ineffective in patrolling Spain's borders to prevent supplies from reaching Franco's forces as well. Hoping to maintain peace, the British government did little to help the Loyalists at all. In France, the issue of the war split the government and led to the fall of the leftist Popular Front. In response to military cooperation in Spain, the Rome-Berlin Axis was formed, also known as Fashintern, an alliance between fascist Italy and fascist Germany. Germany, as a result of the creation of the Axis Alliance, made a move to reoccupy their part of the Rhineland in 1936. This directly violated the Versailles Treaty and the Locarno Pact. The Rhineland had been demilitarized by the Versailles Treaty. It guaranteed France that German forces would not be directly across its border, but we know now that was not the case. The German military high command feared Germany was still too weak to effectively resist a Franco-British invasion and that Hitler was actually being reckless with this move. The League of Nations' futility in earlier crises, however, 
convinced Hitler that France and Britain would do nothing if he moved to reoccupy the Rhineland. And ultimately he was correct. France was unwilling to enforce the treaty without British aid. This may have been the turning point in the balance of power. France was still more powerful than Germany and may have been able to defeat and remove Hitler. But pacifism in Britain made the government reluctant to risk another world war. And because of that, France was unwilling to enforce the treaty without Great Britain's aid behind them. By the mid-1930s, many in Britain believed that Germany had been unfairly punished by the Versailles Treaty. For the first time since World War I, Germany had troops close to the Franco-German border, and this posed a major threat to France's security. Japan invaded China in 1937, also showing aggression. And the League of Nations watched while the rape of Nanjing occurred, but they did little to punish Japan at all. Massacre victims on the shore of Qinghuai River with a Japanese soldier standing nearby is pictured here. Germany's conquest in Europe will lead to World War II. Hitler repudiated the Versailles Treaty and began massive rearmament in the mid-1930s. This was an important reason for Germany's economic recovery from the Depression. This is what gave them the wherewithal to recover. In March of 1938, Hitler declared Anschluss, Germany annexed Austria. In reality, Germany invaded Austria. Germany's threat of military action forced the Austrian Chancellor to resign. The Austrian Nazi Party then assumed control and, quote, requested that Germany annex Austria. Uh, Anschluss occurred in March of 1938. Anschluss means absorption. Germany annexed Austria. In reality, Germany invaded Austria. Germany's threat of military action forced the Austrian Chancellor to resign. The Austrian Nazi Party assumed control and requested Germany to annex Austria. Germany marched into and absorbed Austria without firing a shot. If any of you are familiar with the musical Sound of Music, you note that the Anschluss is the understory that is happening underneath the, the music and the story of the love story. Uh, Captain von Trapp is trying to fight against being required by the Austrian government after Anschluss to serve the German military, to serve in the German Navy. British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain rejected joining an alliance with France and Russia. He believed it to be too aggressive diplomatically and that it might destroy future attempts to negotiate peace with Hitler. Chamberlain still had an appeasement mindset, hoping to avoid war at all costs. As a result, the international community did nothing in response to the Anschluss of Austria. Czechoslovakia is the next piece in the puzzle that Hitler wants. The Sudetenland of Czechoslovakia was the primary target. Hitler demanded that Germany receive the German-speaking province in western Czechoslovakia, or else there would be war. He demanded it. Czechoslovakia refused to give in. It had well-defended borders along its border with Germany and had France as an ally, so thought that it would be safe in refusing Germany's demands. Another world war 
however, now seemed on the horizon. Here is the Sudetenland that Germany is trying to acquire in the dark purple. This will lead to the Munich Conference of 1938. The issue of the Sudetenland was to be resolved in a conference arranged by British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain. The conference was attended by Germany, Britain, France, and Italy. Czechoslovakia and its ally Russia were not invited at all. Chamberlain adopted a policy of appeasement, as stated before. The definition of appeasement is making concessions to an aggressor in order to achieve peace. It was pacifist sentiment in Britain and France that was very strong that led to his adoption of this policy. The solution at the Munich conference seemed to be that Czechoslovakia would be forced to give away the Sudetenland to Hitler because Great Britain and France were not willing to go to war to defend it. Instead, they wanted to appease Hitler, thinking that since three and a half million Germans lived in the Sudetenland anyways, that perhaps national self-determination meant that it should belong to Germany. Germany in return, quote, guaranteed the independence, unquote, of Czechoslovakia. This, of course, will not last. Hitler promised he would make no more territorial demands in Europe if he were given the Sudetenland. If Czechoslovakia refused to comply, however, it would receive no military support from Britain and France for later acts of aggression. Neville Chamberlain took Hitler at his word that Germany would make no more territorial demands, and they shook on it and agreed to allow Germany to take the Sudetenland. Chamberlain returned to Britain a hero among the pacifist community, claiming that he had achieved, quote, peace in our time. This is a Russian cartoon in the wake of the Munich Conference showing the Sudetenland being offered up by the West to the wolf that is wearing a Nazi uniform. Germany ultimately invaded all of Czechoslovakia, not just the Sudetenland, by March of 1939. Hitler was not satisfied with just taking the Sudetenland. He uh, basically duped the West into believing that he, that he would only take the Sudetenland. And in reality, he took the entire state. Hitler double-crossed Chamberlain. Czechoslovakia did not resist the invasion because they saw no way around it. In the space of a year, Hitler had taken both Austria and Czechoslovakia without having to engage in war at all. He took advantage of the appeasement mentality of the Western nations. They were too caught up in their own domestic problems at home because of the depression, because of the economic situation, and because of the memory that many folks had about fighting in World War I and not wanting to go there again. They fed right into Hitler's hands. Here is a picture of Hitler riding through Moravia, Czechoslovakia, in March of 1939. The sequence of events following the Munich Agreement. Germany occupied the Sudetenland in October of 1938. Poland then annexed Zalzoy, an area with a Polish plurality, over which the two countries had fought a war in 1919. They did this in October 1938 as well. Hungary then occupied border areas, the southern third of Slovakia and the southern Carpathian Ruthenia. 
with Hungarian minorities in accordance with the first Vienna Award, November 1938. In March 1939, Hungary annexes Carpathian Ruthenia, which had been autonomous since October 1938. The remaining Czech territories became the German satellite protectorate of Bohemia and Moravia. The remainder of Czechoslovakia became Slovakia, another German satellite. This is the death of Czechoslovakia, the most successful democratic state that was carved out of territories left after World War I. Ultimately, Czechoslovakia was sold down the river by the Western appeasement policy. This will embolden Hitler even more, and Germany will invade Poland. Next, this will begin World War II. One week after taking Czechoslovakia, Hitler demanded the Baltic port city of Danzig, Poland. This was located in the Polish corridor that separated East Prussia from Germany. As he had done with the Sudetenland, Hitler used the alleged poor treatment of ethnic Germans in Poland as a pretext for his demands for this territory. Here is the location. Chamberlain threatened that if Germany attacked Poland, Britain would, in fact, fight a war to protect Poland. Chamberlain, by this point, had woken up and seen what Hitler had done with Czechoslovakia being double-crossed. Hitler sought to avoid a two-front war against France and Britain in the West and Russia in the East as Germany had fought in World War I. So he approached the Soviet Union, even though Stalin was on the opposite end of the political spectrum from Hitler. Remember, they were both totalitarian dictators, nonetheless. And so they were opportunists when it came to this Nazi-Soviet non-aggression pact that was formed in August of 1939. This is not an alliance, but instead a non-aggression pact, an agreement not to act aggressively against each other. Hitler sought assurances that Russia would not attack Germany if he invaded Poland. A guarantee of non-aggression would ensure that Germany would only have to fight a one-front war against France and Britain if war broke out. The world was shocked that the arch enemies Hitler and Stalin would make such an agreement. Public provisions of the treaty, 10-year non-aggression pact between Germany and Russia. Private agreement was also that Germany and Russia, the USSR, would invade Poland and split the country in half. That's why Stalin agreed to the non-aggression pact. Stalin would also get the Baltic states of Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. France and Britain had offered Stalin military risk without gain. Hitler had offered Stalin territorial gain without risk. The Soviet Foreign Commissioner signs the German-Soviet Non-Aggression Pact in this picture. August 23rd. 1939. Another political cartoon showing a unity between Hitler and Stalin. Unlikely uh, friends. They're not really friends, uh, but a non-aggression pact nonetheless. Here's another political cartoon. Wonder how long the honeymoon will last. Not very. And here's yet another. Little Goldilocks um, Riding Hood, the shock of Poland to see Nazi Germany and Soviet Russia, quote, in bed together. Germany invaded Poland on September 1st, 1939. This marked the beginning of World War II. On September 3rd, Britain and France declared war on Germany. The war had begun. 
Okay, so an overview for what we just talked about, Drift to World War II, just to review. These are the different factors that um, led to World War II. There's competition between nations. Once again, imperialism is a factor leading to this war, just like it was with World War I. The failure of disarmament, as we know, that was one of the Versailles Treaty uh, terms. <clears throat> and disarmament fails all around. The failure of the League of Nations, it had no teeth to enforce anything, largely because the big power nations like the United States did not belong to it, <clears throat> and that kind of shot it in the foot from the start. Resentment of the Versailles Treaty, especially in Germany with the very harsh treaty terms, created a climate for the rise of the Nazi Party, <clears throat> as well as resentment of the Versailles Treaty in other areas as well. Um, troubles in new states that were created after World War I, those new states uh, in Central Europe that were created from territories taken from other nations like Austria, Germany, um, as well as the Ottoman Empire. Um, as we know, there were many different ethnic groups that were unhappy with the arbitrary borders that were drawn, feeling as if they were on the wrong side of different borders, including those Germans living in the Sudetenland in Czechoslovakia. <clears throat> And of course, the rise of totalitarianism due to the economic and political stresses. This is the maniacal kind of nationalism that settled in and aided in the drift toward World War II as well. Um, remember Japan's war in China and Chinese resistance also was a factor. The conquest of Chinese Manchuria between 1931 and 1932. The full-scale invasion in 1937 with the rape of Nanjing. Japan signing the pact with Germany and Italy in 1940, and Japanese aggression spurring a united front policy between the Chinese communists and the nationalists, unlikely allies, but uh, they will do so against Chinese aggression, but the communists will gain popular support by the end of the war, which will set the stage for Japan to become a communist nation um, after the war is over under Chairman Mao Zedong. Italian aggression, of course, was another factor that we discussed. Benito Mussolini, um, leader of Italy, fascist leader in Italy, invading Ethiopia, now being successful in, with the invading Ethiopia, unlike prior to World War I, where they were not. <clears throat> they use an overpowering force. There's only 2,000 Italian troops that are killed, um, but 275,000 Ethiopians killed. Italy will also take Libya and Albania as well. German aggression, as we know, Adolf Hitler withdraws from the League of Nations formally. <clears throat> he remilitarizes Germany. He starts seizing territory in Europe, starting with Anschluss or Union with Austria in 1938, putting pressure on the Sudetenland of Czechoslovakia with the Munich Conference. And we know that the appeasers at the Munich Conference basically allowed for uh, Germany to take over the Sudetenland and ultimately they will take over all of Czechoslovakia. The Western appeasement policy that is epitomized with the Munich Conference shows us this. Uh, Italy, France, Great Britain, and Germany all meet together. These negotiations ensue. Czechoslovakia, even though they are the subject of the negotiations, they were not invited. Ultimately, the appeasers, uh, Great Britain and France, not wanting to go to war again at this point, uh, allowed Hitler to take the Sudetenland, arguing that it was national self-determination anyways, uh, since um, so many Germans lived in that area. <clears throat> British Prime Minister at the time, Neville Chamberlain, was the one who um, declared when he came home from the Munich Conference that he has brought peace for our time. This will prove misguided within months, however, uh, and we know that the one lone voice against um, Chamberlain's actions at the Munich Conference, one lone voice against him in Parliament was, of course, Winston Churchill. The next elections in England will allow for Churchill within a few months to become the new Prime Minister, and he will lead England into the war. Hitler, of course, also had signed a secret German, Russian-German Treaty of Non-Aggression, or the Non-Aggression Pact, as it's sometimes called, in August of 1939, to try to avoid a two-front war this time. 
Um, just so everybody knows, he will eventually violate that agreement, um, thinking that he can overrun and take over Russia. But he will uh, not be successful in doing so, and that, of course, opens up the eastern front of the war. That will not happen for, however, another year. So, key concept. Now we're going to discuss Germany's warfare tactic, Blitzkrieg. Germany will uh, start the war um, moving very quickly. Uh, Germany, remember, had been mobilized for war uh, since 1936, uh, while the rest of the world was trying to appease the aggressors and trying to stay out of war. So when the war begins in 1939, Great Britain and France were not ready. They have to mobilize. Um, we know that Germany has already <clears throat> um, avoided bringing Russia into the war initially with the non-aggression pact. So Germany and um, Italy now are able to seize the opportunity while the allies are scrambling to mobilize for the war to take as much territory as they possibly can before the allies are able to strike back. So Germany launches a new kind of warfare that they will utilize to take over territories extremely quickly. And they start this against Poland. It's called Blitzkrieg. Blitzkrieg means lightning war. It's a new type of warfare, uh, so Germany could quickly defeat an enemy by poking a hole in the enemy line and cutting off its front lines from the rear, thus surrounding the enemy. Ultimately, there will be three um, parts to this attack. It used coordinated attacks on one part of the enemy line with a three-pronged attack, air power, they will send the Air Force, the German Luftwaffe Air Force, in to drop aerial assault all over the enemy to soften the target. Surprise attacks, shock and awe, if you will. Then they will send the tanks in, the Panzer Unit tanks, in to poke holes through any defensive lines that had been formed. And once those holes are poked by the tanks, then the artillery units with the infantrymen move in. By doing this uh, three-pronged attack, air, tanks, and artillery, they will be able to soften up the enemy very quickly and overwhelm them before they can launch a counterattack, forcing them to surrender. Germany needs uh, to move quickly because uh, they had suffered so much after World War I with the heavy reparation payments, with the loss of territory, with the loss of resources, they could not fight a prolonged war. They needed to have their attacks be successful as fast as possible so they would not waste resources and they can continue to move on to the next target. So that's why they developed this kind of warfare and it worked very well, especially between 1939 and 1941. Germany will be able to conquer most of Europe within that two-year period. Ultimately, they will be stopped. We will talk about that later. The strategy uh, was developed to try to avoid the trench warfare that was so devastating from World War I. So it's a new kind of attack. Poland was defeated in about a month with the use of the German Blitzkrieg attacks. Because of the uh, non-aggression pact that Hitler had signed with Stalin, he had agreed to a partitioning of Poland uh, when the USSR attacked from the east to take the, their part of Poland. It was an agreement that they had made with that non-aggression pact. And Stalin will next use his foothold in Poland to uh, invade Finland. <clears throat> Again, remember, this non-aggression pact will not last beyond 1941, but at this point it is still in place. The USSR will also annex Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania throughout 1940 while the non-aggression pact is still in place to create a buffer zone against Germany because they recognize that in the future Germany could be a problem to them. Remember, Stalin and Hitler are both totalitarian dictators. One of the left wing, Stalin, one of the right wing, Hitler. They don't like each other, they don't trust each other. This non-aggression pact was what suited them both at this point in time. 
but both of them know that it may not last forever. It may not suit them forever. Remember, the end justifies the means. They're very Machiavellian, and if it doesn't suit them anymore, they'll, they'll abandon it. So they need to protect themselves for that future um, um, possibility. <clears throat> Stalin believed that Hitler would one day invade Russia. So if that was going to happen, he needed to have this buffer zone in place. Here is the um, German um, invasion of Poland uh, and where the Soviets were pushing from the east. You can see the arrows there. 1940. By April of 1940, Hitler also turned his attention westward towards Denmark and Norway. These are Scandinavian territories. Uh, he will take both of those areas fairly quickly with the use of Blitzkrieg. In May, he uh, turns his attention to the Netherlands, to Belgium, and to Luxembourg. Berg. All of them will fall to Germany very quickly. Again, he will use the speed of the Blitzkrieg to take these territories as quickly as possible before the Allies were able to uh, effectively um, mobilized so they could launch a counterattack. Remember, both Great Britain and France had been appeasing Hitler um, to try to stave off war. So they were not ready for war and they were still economically devastated. It's going to be difficult to mobilize quickly for a war with that reality. In June, Hitler decides to try to take over France and then he can effectively knock France out of the war early on. And France will actually fall. France will not be able to launch a counteroffensive against Hitler, not this time. Uh, and uh, within six weeks of entering France with blitzkrieg tactics, Germany takes over France. Here's how the blitzkrieg in France worked. And here is Hitler and his officers in front of the Eiffel Tower after having taken over France. Now there was actually a part of France that would be left, quote, free, end quote. It was called Vichy France. Hitler did not wish to waste time subduing all of France, so he allowed for the southern portion of France to remain, quote, free, like I said before, but in reality, it was not really free. A puppet government was put in place uh, there. They call it the Vichy government because it happened in Vichy, France. Marshal Henri Philippe Pétain was put in charge. Um, of this puppet government and even though technically it was free France in reality it was a puppet uh, satellite state to um, German occupied France. Pétain will eventually after the war is over be executed for treason by the French government. Vichy France was later taken over completely by Germany after Operation Torch in late 1942. By that point, all of France will be considered German-occupied France. So Hitler effectively knocked France out of the war of being a force against him, <coughs> officially anyways, the German, the, sorry, the French government, um, by the end of 1940. The point behind this is that the French government will actually be living in exile, actually in England, for the duration of the war. The French government will work with the English government um, to try to um, launch counteroffensives against the, um, the Axis powers for the duration of the war. Here's a map showing you the occupied zone um, from um, November 1942 and the free zone which was Vichy France, but as we know, eventually all of that will be considered part of occupied France. German occupied France. The Free French, quote unquote, the government, if you will, were led by General Charles de Gaulle. Like I said, the government fled to Britain during France's fall and will organize um, efforts to try to counter the Axis powers from there for the duration of the war.
a tripartite act will be declared or pact rather will be declared in 1940 where Japan officially joins the Rome Berlin axis for a mutual defense and military support so the tripartite pact is also known as the Rome Berlin Tokyo axis so Japan is added to the axis powers which means we have Germany Italy and Japan as the axis powers by 1940 at this point in 1940 we have as the Allied powers Great Britain and the French government which is living in exile in Great Britain the French territory is now under German occupation this looks like there's no way that they could stop the Axis powers in 1940 it did not look good for the Allies key concept so after the fall of 1940 we see that the only real allied power left to try to fight against the Axis that had been scrambling to mobilize was Great Britain and so what Hitler decided he would do is he would try to remove them as a threat as quickly as possible so this will eventually begin the Battle of Britain between July and October of 1940 Hitler at first tried to see if he could get Great Britain to negotiate for peace okay he offered Britain peace if it accepted Germany's control of Western Europe but at this point the British the new British Prime Minister Winston Churchill who had replaced Chamberlain flatly refused Winston Churchill was the one who had said you can may not negotiate with the devil he recognized that Hitler would never be satisfied and you can't make uh, you can't negotiate with these kinds of people so after flatly refusing the offer of peace Hitler then planned a massive German invasion of England Germany tried to soften Great Britain up first with uh, for a German invasion with massive aerial bombings now folks remember Great Britain is an island country in order for Germany to invade they're gonna to have to invade through the water to get to Great Britain and we know that Great Britain has a massive Navy and we also know that the Navy of Germany had been dismantled after World War one and at this point Hitler had focused mostly on rebuilding the armed forces the land forces and the air forces not as much of the Navy at this point so he knew that it was going to be difficult to invade Great Britain <clears throat> also he knew the history Great Britain had not been invaded since 1066 when William of Normandy had done so and that was a long time ago so he knew that he was going to have to soften the target first with his aerial assault with his massive air force the German Luftwaffe and so that the Battle of Britain begins in the air <clears throat> Winston Churchill on June 4th 1940 said we shall fight on the beaches we shall fight on the landing grounds we shall fight in the fields and in the streets we shall fight in the hills we shall never surrender by August the Luftwaffe led by Hermann Goering one of Hitler's inner circle was ordered by Hitler to try to destroy the Royal Air Force of Great Britain the RAF those were the primary targets that they were attacking at first <clears throat> Britain however had a secret weapon that they had been um, given by the United States this new weapon was actually a weapon that was used to detect planes um, a technology rather than a weapon it was radar and every time the German assault began the Royal Air Force planes would already be in the air and the RAF installations that were being bombed by the Germans were not as effective as the Germans would want them to be the planes were in the air and then they were able to launch counterattacks Germany had no idea what this new technology was they had no idea how the Britain the British seemed to always know that they were coming after almost destroying the RAF though it did they did eventually have some impact 
um, Hitler recognized that he was not having a big enough impact to force Great Britain to surrender. You saw the previous quote, Britain was not going to surrender. So instead, he decided to order the bombing of civilian targets, in particular, London, the capital city. And this will be the beginning of what is known as the Blitz. Okay, attacking uh, civilian populations, uh, civilian targets, especially at night, thinking that if they uh, were under cover of night, perhaps the RAF could not see them coming. Again, not recognizing that the RAF had radar. Uh, ultimately, uh, this switch to attacking civilian targets rather than just, uh, you know, military targets will be a fatal error for um, Hitler. The RAF will be able to recover and ultimately they will be able to launch counterattacks against the German Luftwaffe and ultimately defeat the Luftwaffe. Here's a map of the Battle of Britain. Here are some of the um, ruins from the aerial assaults that happened in the cities, like London, after the Blitz. Standing up gloriously out of the flames and smoke of surrounding buildings, St. Paul's Cathedral is pictured during the Great Fire Raid. Winston Churchill with King George VI of Britain and the Queen Mother. This is a World War II poster featuring Churchill's famous quote about the RAF. Never in the field of human conflict was so much owed by so many to so few. Recognizing the importance of the RAF, refusal to give up. Hitler was forced to call off the invasion of Britain in September. He was not going to be able to launch a amphibious or through water assault of Great Britain with his small navy. <clears throat> he did not have the effect uh, that he wanted with his aerial assault. Blitzkrieg tactics would not work with Great Britain because of their location as an island country. Germany ultimately lost 2,433 planes. The RAF only lost 900. Now, the RAF has, had not been quite as uh, ready for war as Germany had been, so that was a huge loss for them, but uh, it allowed them to survive. The bombing of civilian targets, however, the Blitz, as it will be called, the Blitz by the Germans over civilian targets in England, will continue, even though the invasion was called off. <clears throat> it will continue through May of 1941. And so a lot of the uh, Londoners had to uh, move to the countryside in order to um, survive these attacks. The significance of this is that Hitler now had to guard against a future two-front war. Uh, not being able to force Great Britain to capitulate made him recognize that if he was going to keep moving, he had now needed to look elsewhere um, to take territory. And this will force him to look eastward towards Russia towards breaking that non-aggression pact so he can continue to move. Remember, that's the thing with totalitarian dictators. There always has to be an enemy to devour. They have to keep moving. They can't be stagnant. Peace is not really an option. Um, he wants to take over all of Europe. He's not going to be able to force Great Britain to capitulate at this point, so he needs to turn his attention eastward to Russia. We will eventually see that <clears throat> Great Britain, because they held strong, that is one of the reasons why by the last year of the war, one of the biggest offensives that Great Britain will participate in along with the United States is D-Day. This will not happen until 1944, but it will be launched from Great Britain. And it was able to be launched from Great Britain because Britain was able to hold off the Nazis in 1940. The Battle of Britain will be a failure for Hitler. All right, so like I said, now Hitler's going to start looking eastward towards invading the Soviet Union. All along, Hitler had planned that he knew he would probably eventually invade 
Russia to fulfill his dream of Lebensraum. Remember, living space. He needs food in particular for uh, the, the Aryan race, if you will, the Germans. He needs living space. He needs more territory. And, of course, we know that Russia was still a, a primarily agrarian nation. So the invasion was Hitler's, however, greatest blunder. Uh, we know others have tried to invade Russia before. We know Napoleon had tried to do this. We know that Russia has, uh, as its best weapon, the Russian winter. If they can hold off their opponent long enough to draw them in while, and let winter set in, they can use that to their advantage. That's exactly what's going to happen here. All right, so the Soviets do the same thing with the onslaught of the Nazi forces that they did back when Napoleon tried to invade. They used scorched earth tactics where they destroy anything of value as they retreat deeper into the Soviet Union, trading space for time. By burning all the stuff on that earth, they allow the Germans to walk in freely, yes, but the Germans don't have any supplies that they can um, that they can requisition from the lands where they're coming in. Okay, they did this to deprive the Germans of any, uh, any resources. Thousands of towns in the USSR were destroyed by these tactics, yes, but it would pull the Germans into a place where they would get stuck if the winter set in. This is a political cartoon showing the end of the Russo-German Pact or the Nazi-Soviet Non-Aggression Pact. You can see Hitler is giving Stalin um, a hug with a knife in his hand, stabbing him in the back. And he says, forgive me, comrade, but it seems such a good opportunity. <clears throat> As we will see, it's going to prove to be another blunder for Hitler. This uh, invasion of Russia was nicknamed by the Germans Operation Barbarossa, um, and it shows you that the Germans were able to launch an attack into Russia from Poland um, starting in June of 1941. They moved hundreds of miles inland, almost all the way to Moscow fairly quickly because the uh, Soviets retreated while scorching earth. But then they will get stuck. By December of 1941, you see the dotted line there. They are stuck. And this that will be the line of the Eastern Front of the war. And stalemate will begin there as a result. Here's uh, another map. By winter, the Germans were at the gates of Moscow while lying siege to Leningrad, which used to be called St. Petersburg. And, uh, but they got stuck because the winter settled in. And as we know, that is the best weapon of the um, Russians. So this will create a stalemate that will last pretty much for two years. Lots of loss of life, very little gain. In the USSR, World War II became known as the Great Patriotic War of the Fatherland because they were defending themselves against Nazi oppression. This is another map of the Eastern Front um, where it, and, and the movement, even though there was a lot of movement, we see that there's not a lot of gain being made after December of 1941. Uh, and that is going to eventually be uh, devastating for uh, Hitler. Now, in August of 1941, while the uh, invasion of Russia is happening, Churchill and the U.S. President Franklin Roosevelt, or FDR as he's sometimes known, met secretly. They did this because FDR recognized by this point that the United States was going to probably be drawn into this war eventually. Now, one of the things that the U.S. had been doing with Great Britain uh, since the beginning of the fighting 
was supplying them with munitions, even giving them some of our pilots during the Battle of Britain to help, uh, you know, fend off the German advance. Remember, radar was our technology that we gave to the British to try to fend off the, um, the Battle of Britain as well. So even though technically we were just like at the beginning of World War I, quote, neutral, end quote, we were not really. We were really supportive of our previous ally, Great Britain. <clears throat> so the Atlantic Charter uh, was created in August of 1941. The agreement was this, once the Axis powers were defeated, hopefully that they would be, there would be no territorial changes contrary to the wishes of the inhabitants. The Americans wanted to make sure, once and for all, self-determination, which was originally one of Wilson's 14 points, would rule the day when this war was over. The agreement also called for, quote, a permanent system of general security which later will become the United Nations to replace the failed League of Nations. This Atlantic Charter is the first idea we see towards planning for a post-war world. Remember, Wilson was the only one who had had any kind of plan for the post-war world um, during World War I. Uh, they're trying to avoid, the Allies are trying to avoid that reality happening once again. Instead of waiting until the end to have some kind of plan in place, they wanted to maybe have something in place prior to the end of the fighting. And the United States is not even officially in this war for another couple of months. Stalin endorsed the agreement also. This is a recognition that even though uh, <clears throat> there's not an official alliance between Great Britain and Russia. In reality, by August of 1941, since Russia is fighting against Germany and Great Britain is fighting against Germany, in reality, they are allies because they have a common enemy. So we have Great Britain as an ally. We have at least the government of France in exile in England, even though France itself is occupied by Germany. And we have the Soviet Union as an ally. And eventually, as we see, we're going to have the U.S. in the allies as well. Meanwhile, however, at this point in August, the U.S. remained militarily neutral, but this will change in December of 1941. The reason I want you guys to remember these dates, this date of 1941, is that at the beginning of 1941, Hitler thought himself on top of the world. Yes, he had failed to take over Great Britain, but he had taken over all of Western Europe. He had forced France to capitulate. He had taken over all of Western and Central Europe, uh, and he had a non-aggression pact with Russia, but by the summer of 1941, when he decides to invade Russia, that will change that. It brings Russia into the war. He's not able to take over Russia as quickly as he had hoped, and that brings Russia into the war. Then by December of 1941, because Japan had been added to the Axis powers, the United States will enter the war. So by the end of 1941, it is a completely different war than it was at the beginning of 1941. Different players had been added against the Axis powers and that will change everything. It is a completely different war. The neutrality acts that had been signed in the United States in the 1930s had prevented FDR from drawing the US into the conflict earlier than December 1941. We did, however, initiate the Lend-Lease Act of 1941 that gave large amounts of money and supplies to help Britain and the Soviets eventually effectively, um, but it effectively ended U.S. neutrality, as we know. Here is a graphic showing the total Lend-Lease aid, about $28 billion by June 30th, 1944 was lent from the United States to the Allied Powers. Here's the flow of the Lend-Lease aid as well. 
Of course, it was Japan's attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941, that resulted in America's official entry into the war. Although we had been gearing up for it for quite some time, this is the act, this is the, the catalyst, the straw that breaks the camel's back, that formally draws the United States into the war. FDR signed the U.S. Declaration of War against Japan the very next day on December 8, 1941. Hitler then declared war on the U.S. three days later, December 11th. This actually proved to be another fatal blunder for Hitler. Instead of focusing on Japan, who had attacked the U.S., by Hitler doing this, the U.S., along with Great Britain, would now instead focus on defeating Germany first. Hitler assumed that the U.S. would concentrate on Japan first, even if the United States, even sorry, even if he had declared war on the United States. But he was hoping that this would um, ultimately mean that when the U.S. did come in to fight against Germany, they would still be fighting against Japan and have their forces divided. Now, in reality, that is what happens. We do end up fighting two fronts at the same time, the Pacific theater against Japan and the European theater against Hitler and Mussolini. But instead of us focusing on Japan first, like Hitler thought, we actually focused on the European theater of the war first, which was not what he thought we would do. And this would allow us to bolster the Allied forces. Uh, it would not be an easy go. It would take a long time um, for us to be able to uh, defeat Germany with the Allies, but it will happen. This is known as the Grand Alliance. In 1942, it's formally declared. And of course, it consists of Great Britain, the Soviet Union, and the US. It also has about three dozen other countries as part of it as well. And of course, the government of France living in exile in, um, in Great Britain. But the French nation itself, the people living, they are still living in German-occupied France. Here are the World War II alliances. The Axis powers also included Hungary, Romania, and Bulgaria, in addition to the original three, Germany, Italy, and Japan. The Grand Alliance, or the Allies, of course, Great Britain, France, even though France is, is just their government, the people are still under the occupation of Germany. The USSR comes in in 1941, as does the US. China and 43 other countries also are members of the Grand Alliance, ultimately. <clears throat> so, is the Nazi Empire in Europe now? Let's talk about this. The German victories by the end of 1941 were this. They controlled all of Western Europe, except for neutral Switzerland and Sweden. They controlled Austria. Czechoslovakia, Western Poland, France, the Netherlands, Belgium, Luxembourg, Norway, and even Western Russia. Spain allowed Germany the use of its ports because remember Spain was under the government of Francisco Franco who was a fellow fascist. Although Spain remained essentially quote neutral militarily, they were really uh, I guess you would say supporters of the Axis because of their friendship with Germany and um, Italy because of the uh, fellow fascist government that we have there. And of course, Germany and Italy had supported Franco's takeover of Spain back in 1936. So here's World War II Combat Europe. The area of maximum Axis expansion by September of 1942 is everything located in red. The neutral territory is in yellow. And those other territories that are part of the Grand Alliance or that are neutral, like Spain, okay, are located in green. The German allies were Italy, Japan, Romania, Hungary, and Bulgaria, as stated before. Britain was isolated, although she gained much aid from the U.S., as we know, 
Key concept. The Nazi new racial order will begin uh, starting in 1942. The Nazis exploited the fact that they had taken over most all of Europe. Uh, and they exploited it for its economic value. They now had Lebensraum. The Nordic peoples, such as the Dutch, the Norwegians, and the Danes, received preferential treatment as they were racially related to the Germans. Hitler heavily taxed the French as they were seen as, quote, inferior Latin-based people. They were tolerated as a race, but they were seen as second-class citizens. Slavs in Eastern Europe were seen as almost subhuman by the Nazi party. Germany seized men and women for slave labor to work in German factories throughout German-controlled Europe from the Slavic community. He also, of course, took Jews, as we know. Hitler planned that Poles, Ukrainians, and Russians would be enslaved and forced to die out while Germanic peasants resettled the resulting abandoned lands in those parts of Europe, the eastern parts of Europe. Polish workers and Soviet prisoners of war were transported to Germany where they did most of the heavy labor and were systematically worked to death. We'll see the same thing happen, of course, with the Jewish community and what is known as the Holocaust. 80% of Soviet prisoners, Soviet prisoners of war, did not survive the war. The genocide that happens in the Holocaust was of the Jews, the Gypsies, and even Jehovah Witnesses, as well as captured communists. Their businesses and property were confiscated. Jews had to register with the government authorities and wear yellow ID stars on their clothing, stars of David. In Poland, Jews were forced to live first in ghettos, which is certain parts of the cities, like Warsaw and Krakow. Eventually, they would be um, deprived of adequate supplies in those ghettos. Several families were crammed into single apartments, making it very difficult to live. Many deaths will occur as a result of this. And they were forbidden contact with the outside world. This is the beginning of what will be the new order, Hitler's new order for the Jews. After ghettoizing them, eventually he will clean out those ghettos and send them to concentration camps. Here's the ghetto wall in Warsaw, May of 1941, that cuts off the ghetto of Warsaw from the rest of the country, from the rest of the city of Warsaw. Here are orphans in the Warsaw Ghetto, and these are just examples of just one ghetto in one city in one place. This was happening all over German-controlled Europe for the Jews, the Gypsies, and other undesirables, as they were called. Here's a photo after the Warsaw Ghetto uprising. There will be an uprising in the Warsaw Ghetto in 1943, uh, and they were the people were for, forcibly pulled out of dugouts after the rebellion, and then they would be shipped to concentration camps, many of them shipped to death camps. Here's another photo after the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising of 1943. These Jews that you see pictured here were sent to the Treblinka death camp, even children. The final solution to the Jewish problem, as it was called by Hitler, it is now known as the Holocaust by most of us, began in late 1941. The formal plan came at the Wannsee Conference in 1942, however. Six death camps would be established. There would be concentration camps or labor camps for Jews, but then there would also be six death camps that were built in Poland in addition to those hundreds of concentration camps. These death camps would become death factories to get rid of the undesirable Jews or those that were unable to work or were seen as non-essential. Auschwitz was the most notorious of these six death camps and about one million people will die there before the end of the war. <laughs>
overall with the final solution, six million Jews were killed. This is approximately two thirds of the pre-war Jewish population. And of that um, number, a great deal of them, something like 40% of those people were children under the age of 12. Between five and six million others besides Jews were also murdered in the Holocaust, including political prisoners, Jehovah Witnesses, gypsies, and of course the LGBT community. Here are estimates of Jewish losses that you can take a look at at a later time. Here are, uh, here's a map that shows you where concentration camps and death camps were located. The Jewish Holocaust death toll as a percentage of the total pre-war Jewish population um, in these areas is uh, broken down in this map. The rest of the world largely ignored the Holocaust while millions of Jews were sent to concentration camps and death camps. This is a view of the entrance to the main camp of Auschwitz. The gate bears the motto, work makes one free. Here's a picture of Hitler with some camp officials. officials. Auschwitz main camp, an aerial view. Here's women in Auschwitz, women who were fit for work after the delousing process, meaning shaving their heads, getting rid of any lice, uh, the disinfection of those not selected for the gas chambers and the shaving of their heads was all part of the registration process at the camp. After they finished, they were given the prison uniforms seen here in the picture. And of course they were tattooed on their arm with a number. They became a number. They were not human beings. They were not considered human beings by the Nazis. They were like vermin. They were considered vermin by the Nazis. Here's slave laborers at Buchenwald. Um, what's interesting about this picture is if you look in the center row of the center, center column, center row, right in the center, the, on the far right, you will see a man's head peeking out from behind another man. That man in the center there uh, is Elie Wiesel, who is the author of the book Night, which many of you have read. Um, I think you might have read it in eighth grade or before. Elie Wiesel was here at Buchenwald. Here are survivors in the Russian camp. This is after the camps were liberated at the end of the war. Some of the survivors and how they um, appeared. Sorry, it's, it's kind of devastating to look at. <clears throat> Underground movements uh, sprang up and increased during the war, as we know. Uh, many of these underground movements would sabotage Nazi supply depots and supply lines. They would derail trains and blow up bridges to try to keep the Nazis out of a certain place or keep the Nazis in a certain place so they couldn't get to other places. Uh, the French underground is the most famous example. Uh, these are people that are freedom fighters that are still living in France um, under German occupation. Uh, they were working undercover and underground against the uh, Nazi occupation. Um, many of these underground movements also supplied the Allies with valuable information about the Nazis uh, through coded messages, etc. Uh, they detailed troop movements. They helped to publish secret newspapers that were encoded. Uh, they hid escaped Allied prisoners and downed Allied pi uh, pi pilots from being captured by the Nazis. So the underground movements were uh, extremely important in the fight against the Axis powers. Key concept. So now let's talk about some of the turning points of the war. 1942 is an important year when looking at the turning points of the war. Okay, we already talked about one turning point in the war being 1941 meaning that by the end of 1941, we had different players involved in the war than we had at the beginning of 1941. 
By the time we get to the end of 1942, we also have another big turning point. There are three key battles that happen um, in 1942 that all work to turn the tide against the Axis powers. The Axis powers will lose their offensive capabilities after 1942 because of three, these three key battles. First, I'm going to talk about the ones that happen in the European theater. Um, the Battle of El Alamein is one of them, uh, November of 1942. Uh, by November, the British forces that were led by General Bernard Montgomery were able to drive the Germans that were led by Erwin Rommel, known as the Desert Fox, out of Egypt. Egypt, remember, had been a British colony. Egypt had been overrun by the Nazis at the beginning of the war uh, when the British were trying to mobilize for the war. So uh, Great Britain will be able to, quote, liberate Egypt from Nazi control with the Battle of El Alamein in November of 1942. This ultimately will open up the Mediterranean area to the Allied forces allowing the Allies to try to attack the Axis powers from the underbelly of Europe. The soft, weakest link in the Axis powers was Italy by this point. They were starting to run out of money, um, and so this will open up the Mediterranean to the Allied powers so they can start attacking the Axis through Italy, of course, um, from this point forward. Kind of pushing back the Italian forces, moving up the Italian peninsula. The German forces at the Battle of Al Alamein um, were pushed westward across northern Africa, away from um, Egypt, and uh, they will lose control over Egypt, and ultimately they lost control over the Mediterranean basin. This will help to launch Operation Torch in November of 1942. This is uh, the U.S. and British forces land on the beaches of Morocco and Algeria and engaged in um, the retreating German forces who were moving away from Egypt in battle. Operation Torch will also help to secure the Allied position in Northern Africa, again reinforcing now Allied control of the Mediterranean Basin and the ability to attack the Axis powers from southern Europe. So this is all still part of the Battle of El Alamein, that one battle. Okay, even though Operation Torch technically is not El Alamein, it's still part of that same turning point battle, if you will. Uh, Rommel's Africa Corps, that's what they were called, uh, were surrounded by Allied armies, and by May of 1943, they were completely defeated and removed from Africa while suffering mass casualties and prisoners of war. Hitler's decision to invade the USSR instead of defeating Britain in the Mediterranean now proved disastrous. The Allied victory in North Africa opened the door for the invasion of Italy by July of 1943, as I stated before. Now, a second key battle in 1942, uh, begins in 1942, I should say, it goes through the beginning of 1943, is the Battle of Stalingrad. This is on the eastern front of the European uh, theater of the war. It is a critical battle of the eastern front. It is the first German land defeat in Europe. It will end the stalemate in Russia that had been there for about a year and a half by this point. Hitler sought to take the industrial city of Stalingrad en route to taking control of the Soviet oil fields in the Caucasus Mountain region. He launched an offensive to do this. It would prove disastrous. The German armies were eventually surrounded by Soviet forces. The Soviet forces were, who were entrenched at Stalingrad were eventually able to uh, encircle the German armies and uh, force a defeat. Hitler refused to allow the German forces to surrender. Even though the German um, officers were sending word back to Hitler that they were surrounded and that if they were going to cut their losses of men and supplies, they needed to surrender, 
Hitler refused to allow them to surrender, and thus the bulk of the German army in Stalingrad, which was about 300,000 men, was almost completely destroyed in this battle. This would be costly losses for Germany, that he could have cut some of those losses if he had allowed for a surrender. But Hitler would not allow for any surrender. This same mindset of this totalitarian dictator uh, not allowing any kind of surrender um, to try to save some of his men, to save some of his forces, will also come into play as we will see later on in 1944 as we go into D-Day. So kind of keep that in the back of your mind. After this battle, the Soviets began a two and a half year campaign, offensive campaign of pushing the German army slowly but surely all the way back to Berlin. From this point forward, after the Battle of Stalingrad, now in the eastern th front of the European theater, the Soviets were pushing um, westward. They were on the offensive and the Nazis would be on the defensive. The Nazis would lose territory over and over again from this point forward. This, of course, is going to eventually lead to the uh, loss of Germany um, by 1945. The subsequent Battle of Kursk that happened in July of 1943 ultimately was the largest tank battle in human history, ending in a Russian victory. The Russian tanks, which were not nearly as sophisticated as the German Panzer tanks, ultimately were able to defeat the German tanks, and this is largely because of the losses of so many German forces and tanks at the Battle of Stalingrad. By February of 1945, the Soviet armies had penetrated the outskirts of Berlin. Simultaneously, the Western allies, the United States and Great Britain, were pushing from the west with the um, D-Day invasion. Um, and we will talk more about that Western Front here in just uh, a little bit. But by that point, by February of 1945, the Allied powers have Germany isolated and are closing in on all sides. Again, we'll talk more about the Western Front um, of the European theater in a later slide. So, 1942, there was a third key Allied victory that happened, but it was in the Pacific. It was the Battle of Midway in the Pacific Theater. It was the U.S. versus Japan, which will end in a U.S. victory. So the tide will turn against Japan at the same time that the tide is turning against the Axis powers within Europe. Um, we'll talk more about that Battle of Midway in the Pacific Theater when I, when I start focusing on the Pacific Theater. But just so you know, that is the third key uh, turning point battle in 1942. Um, so if you want to review, we have the Battle of El Alamein, which liberates northern Africa from Axis control. We have the Battle of Stalingrad, which forced Germany out of Russia ultimately, and the Russians on the offensive at that point. And then, of course, we have the Battle of Midway, which ultimately was a victory for the United States against Japan, allowing the United States to go on an island-hopping campaign to roll back the influence of Japan throughout the Pacific. Even though this will not be the end of the war, by the end of 1942, the Axis powers have lost their offensive capability and they are losing ground and they are being encircled and surrounded. Even though the war will not be over for another two and a half years, it is the beginning of the end for the Axis powers, 1942 those three key battles. Here is a Soviet soldier waving the red banner over the central plaza of Stalingrad in 1943, declaring that a victory. Here is a um, map of the Nazi Germany retreat from the USSR starting in 1943. And of course they're having to retreat over all that scorched earth and they can't resupply themselves, and many of them starved to death in the process. Again, more loss of troops for the Nazis. 
Okay, as promised, now we're going to start focusing on the western front of the European theater of the war. And we really see an, the major offensive happening for the Allied powers against the Axis at D-Day. It's the known as Operation Overlord, or D-Day as we now call it, beginning on June 6, 1944. 120,000 troops will cross the English Channel from southern England and invade France in an amphibious assault on the beaches of Normandy, the northern French coast. This will be a combined Allied assault on German-occupied France. The United States, Canada, and Great Britain all participate as well as the French government uh, that was living in exile in England, of course, were involved in the planning of this as well. The success of D-Day demonstrated how important the Battle of Britain had been in 1940, when Germany failed to defeat the RAF completely and invade England. Because if they had been successful there, D-Day would never been able to happen. So, that was significant turning point. Had the invasion, um, the D-Day invasion failed, Germany would have been able to concentrate its forces against the Soviets on the Eastern Front, perhaps resulting in a stalemate. This is why this invasion was so important. It will divert some of the German attention away from what's going on in Eastern Europe, as they are losing ground against the Soviets, they actually have to now divide their forces and send some of them to try to defend uh, their occupation in France. And this will allow for the Russians on the Eastern Front to continue to push their offensive and push the Germans out of Russia and then force them on the run, losing more and more territory in Europe. This is that important of an invasion. Here is a map of Operation Overlord or D-Day, the Norman beach, uh, the beaches of Normandy. You can see there are five different landing points, different beaches with landing points. You have the the U.S. attacking at the the beach, uh, Utah Beach and Omaha Beach. You have uh, the Brits attacking on Gold Beach. You have the Canadians attacking on Juno Beach, and then of course you have the Brits also attacking on Sword Beach. The U.S. troops storm Omaha Beach in, in Normandy on June 6, 1944. Here's a picture that was taken by one of the soldiers uh, that was manning the ships as they were uh, um, emptying um, and the men were marching onto the shores. Here's a soldier that ser serves as a human anchor in the right foreground for the Coast Guard soldiers. Only six of the 36 who used the line made it to the beach. It was devastating losses that were suffered during the D-Day invasion, but ultimately the D-Day invasion would be successful for the Allies. And probably one of the best movies um, that has been made about this invasion, well actually there's a couple, of course, uh, Saving Private Ryan, um, but I think my favorite is the HBO series called Band of Brothers um, about the uh, invasion of Normandy and the subsequent, uh, you know, battles that happen on the Western Front, forcing the end of the war. The Normandy Beach as it appeared after D-Day. After attacking and getting a foothold on the beach of Normandy. The uh, Allies are now able to roll back German influence in Western Europe. A Western Front is now established, and this will spell the end of Nazi domination in Europe eventually, but it will take another year before the Nazis will be completely defeated. There's still a lot of fighting to do. Paris would be liberated finally one month after the uh, beaches of Normandy were, um, were attacked and uh, the government will be able to be reestablished. Hitler was now fighting on three fronts 
Eastern Front against the Russians, on the Western Front against the U.S. and Great Britain, and France, and Canada, and in Italy against the U.S. and Great Britain. By the fall, Allied troops, by fall of 1944, Allied troops had reached the German border and were preparing for an invasion of Germany. In December of 1944, in a last ditch effort to try to launch one last counter offensive, Hitler decided to attack uh, in Belgium at the Battle of the Bulge, as it will come to be known. This is Hitler's last gasp offensive to drive the Allies away from the Western German border. France now was in the hands of the Allies. Uh, Germany had been pushed out of France. This was brutal fighting in the dead of winter in the Belgian forest. This is almost in exactly the same place that the Argonne Offensive had happened at the, the, or the Second Battle of the Marne that it, at the end of World War I. After Hitler's counteroffensive failed, ultimately the Battle of the Bulge will be an Allied victory, but thousands of men were lost in the process. It was a costly victory for the Allies, but they would win. Um, the Allies will quickly penetrate deep into Germany in 1945. And of course, the Western Allies are pushing, racing to Berlin from the West, as well as the uh, Soviets, Eastern Allies, pushing from the East, forcing Germany into a vice surrounding Germany. By the way, by the time we get to the beginning of 1945, we see a capitulation of Italy. So they had lost control over Italy. The Italian people had actually. Um, rebelled against Mussolini and actually he would be hung and so the Allies had liberated Italy and had now forced were pushing from the south as well so Germany was being surrounded on all sides so the Ardennes offensive also known as the Battle of the Bulge like I say happening in almost exactly the same place a little bit different but in the same basic area of that uh, Second Battle of the Marne that happened after at the end of World War II. On May 8, 1945, Germany surrendered. This picture is kind of a misnomer because this picture is one of the last pictures taken of Adolf Hitler during his last days in his bunker underneath the Reich Chancellery in Berlin. This is not a picture of him surrendering to anybody because he never committed, he never surrendered. His men will surrender because Hitler committed suicide on April 30th, 1945, when it looked as if he would not be able to defeat um, the Western Allies pushing in on Berlin from the West or the Soviets pushing in from the, from the East. Actually, the Soviets got to Berlin first. Uh, there was a last battle of Berlin that Hitler was fighting against the Soviets, but he will lose that battle. And instead of surrendering himself, he commits suicide on April 30th, 1945. Many of his other, uh, other men will do the same. Himmler also commits suicide. Uh, those uh, German officers that are left uh, are the ones that will sign the surrender to the Soviets on May 8th, 1945. The end of the war against Japan, however, will not happen for another few months. So victory in Europe by May of 1945, VE Day, May 8th, 1945. But the war will continue in the Pacific between the US and Japan for another few months. Now, since the victory at Midway had happened in 1942, the US had gone on an island hopping campaign and they were rolling back the Japanese control of Asia little by little by doing that. However, there were heavy U.S. losses that were suffered throughout that time period. Between 1942 and 44, so many losses happened that uh, by 1944, in the battles of places like Iwo Jima and Okinawa, the U.S. lost so many troops that they make a decision to try to use a new kind of weapon to try to force Japan to surrender. 
the U.S. ultimately had been developing a nuclear weapon, an atomic bomb, to drop, they thought initially, on, on Germany. We uh, actually um, will never get the chance to use it against the Germans before the Germans surrender. By the fall of 1945, with the idea that the U.S. might have to invade Tokyo because the J Japanese refused to surrender even though they were losing battle after battle, the President of the United States at this time, by this point, is Harry Truman. FDR had died in office um, a few, uh, several weeks before. Um, the decision is made to drop this atomic weapon on Japan to try to force them to surrender. Now, there will be two bombs that will be dropped. The first will be dropped on Hiroshima, Japan, and the second will be dropped on Nagasaki, Japan. And this placed tremendous pressure on the Japanese government to surrender. The Soviet Union had not entered the war against Japan until August 8th. Okay? The Soviets had refused to join the war against Japan until they were given some other um, guarantees by the Western allies. We'll talk more about these diplomatic meetings that are going on between the Western allies, the United States and Great Britain, and the Soviet Union actually during the war going on. And uh, even though we were on the same side of the war, you see a lot of tension starting to form between the Soviet Union and those Western allies. Um, the Soviet Union refused to enter the war against Japan until certain promises were made to them, which we'll discuss in a later slide. Uh, they will not declare war on Japan until August 8th, and that was just days before, you know, we decide to drop this bomb. Japan will eventually surrender after the dropping of the second bomb although the emperor was allowed to remain on the throne. General Tojo, however, was not allowed to survive, and he will be executed. August 9, 1945, formally, the, the second uh, bomb being dropped. This is one day after um, the uh, Soviets had declared war on Japan. Obviously, since they just declared war on Japan, they will not ever actually send a troop into Japan. But after we dropped the first one on August 6th on Hiroshima, then the Soviets declare war on August 8th, then we drop the second bomb on August 9th, Japan decides to surrender. Now, just so you know, Japan had no way of knowing that we only had those two bombs ready to drop. They assumed, and we let them assume, that we probably had more atomic weapons in our arsenal and we could continue to drop bombs on their cities until they surrendered. Here is Nagasaki before on the top and after on the bottom. So much destruction. Now, I mentioned before that there had to be negotiations going on during the war, especially between the two sides of the Allies. And we see this starting to happen in 1943. The first conference that happens um, among the Allied powers happened in 1943 at Casablanca. This was actually just the Western Allies meeting. FDR was still alive at this point as the U.S. President, and Churchill, remember, he was the uh, British Prime Minister, um, at the Casablanca conference, Stalin, no Soviet officials invited to this one. Uh, they declared a policy of unconditional surrender, surrender for all enemies. They would not accept anything less than unconditional surrender for the war to end. Italy would be invaded first before opening a second front in France. It was also determined that they would start the uh, process of um, invading from the south, from Italy, first after, remember this is after they had opened up the Mediterranean with the victory at the Battle of El Alamein by the end of 1942. This is what will make Stalin very angry. Stalin argued that he and the Soviet forces had been completely alone on the Eastern Front 
and if a western front was not opened by trying to liberate France so Germany's forces had to be diverted sooner rather than later it would cost millions more Soviet deaths so when it was determined that Italy would be invaded first before trying to liberate France this will anger Stalin because it means more Russian deaths before the Western Front would be opened and of course this sets a precedent these this hardening of of tensions between the Western Allies meaning the US and Great Britain and the Soviet Union this is creating a climate for when after the war is over we'll have the beginning of what is known as the Cold War the West versus the Soviets okay so we are actually planting the seeds for the Cold War here starting in 1943 in the last two years of World War II they will be fighting against a common enemy in World War II but the Western Allies and the Soviet Union will have division between them once the war is over and this all begins before the war even ends Stalin never forgave the Allies for putting off an invasion of France to divert some of the Soviet sorry some of the uh, Nazi troops away from the Eastern Front until 1944 and ensure the Russians would have to fight the brunt of the German army alone for another year the Tehran conference happens in 1943 and this is the first big meeting of the big three all three of the uh, primary allied powers FDR or Roosevelt from the United States Churchill from Great Britain and Stalin from the Soviet Union the Allies agreed to the invasion of Western Europe beginning in 1944 at the Tehran conference this is when they all agreed that the D-Day invasion would take place Stalin reaffirmed the Soviet commitment to enter the war against Japan once Germany had been defeated this is what I was talking about in that previous slide Stalin refused to declare war on Japan which means the United States was fighting against Japan in the Pacific all by themselves until Germany had been defeated completely so this is why they held off on um, that declaration of war and so the United States is fighting against Japan alone meanwhile you know Stalin said hey we've been fighting against Germany alone in Eastern Europe because you wouldn't open up this Western front of the war for another year again chilly tensions between the two different sides of the Allied powers this is setting the stage for the Cold War folks Stalin insisted on Soviet control of Eastern Europe and the carving up of Germany amongst the Allies at this conference Churchill demanded that when the when it was over that governments in Eastern Europe be free they be allowed to establish their own governments and there should be a strong Germany after the war meaning stable okay to preserve the balance of power in Europe they he wanted Germany to be a democracy rather than being dominated by um, a communist government of course Stalin will have other ideas uh, Germany will eventually it'll be determined in a later conference that it will be divided between the East and the West uh, Roosevelt acted as a mediator and be believed that he could work with Stalin to achieve a post-world peace within the construct of the United Nations um, uh, if given the chance uh, he will determine later on that that's going to be a difficult thing and with later negotiations the Yalta conference is probably the biggest of these conferences okay the Yalta conference happens two years later in 1945 this is when the big three meet once more right before the end of the war it starts in February of 1945 so this is just about three months before the war is over in Europe but about six seven eight months before it's over in the Pacific and it happens on Stalin's turf in Yalta in Russia Stalin agreed at the Yalta conference to enter the Pacific War within three months after Germany surrendered 
Now, instead of just saying, once Germany surrenders, once Germany is defeated, I'll enter the uh, Pacific War, he says three months after Germany surrendered to buy himself some time. Stalin agreed to a declaration of liberated Europe, which called for free elections. But in reality, he never really allows this to happen in the territories that he will have occupied after rolling back the Nazi occupation in those regions of Eastern Europe. We'll talk more about that in the Cold War lecture. The Yalta Conference also called formally for the creation of the United Nations. It would be um, uh, beginning meetings in April of 1945. Uh, this will be a new international organization that will replace the old failed League of Nations. Now, this idea had been floated before at earlier conferences, but it will formally be declared to be a reality um, at this conference. The Soviets would be allowed to have three votes in the General Assembly, where every other nation just had one. Now, you might be asking why. This was something that Stalin demanded because he believed that A, the Soviet Union was so large and so diverse of a population that they should have three votes, since they were so much larger than every other nation. But B, he argued that they deserved this because of all the significant losses that they had suffered at the hands of the Nazis, holding the line in Eastern Europe while the um, Western allies refused to open up the Western front of the European theater until 1944. So in order for Stalin to agree to become part of the United Nations, and remember, you can't have a successful international organization if all of the big power nations don't belong to it. So he basically said, if I don't get three votes in the General Assembly, the, we will not join the United Nations. So the negotiation was made and they allowed for the Soviet Union to have three votes as opposed to everybody else's one. The US, Britain, the USSR, France and China, however, would all be members of a permanent Security Council. And the Security Council had veto power. So if the, in the General Assembly the Soviets' three votes uh, made it so a, an initiative would be able to be passed that, say, the U.S. or Great Britain did not want, any one member of the Security Council could use their veto power to overrule the General Assembly. So the U.S. felt that they could always use the veto to overrun the USSR. But remember, the USSR is also a member of the Security Council, and the, the USSR could use that veto power to overrule anything that the General Assembly passed that they didn't like if they, their three votes didn't give them enough votes to, you know, uh, not let something pass that they didn't want. So again, this is going to be all hashed out more in the Cold War lecture. Germany was also, it was decided that once the war was over, uh, that Germany would be divided into zones of occupation and a coalition government would be created in that nation of communists in the eastern part meaning it would be looked over by the Soviet Union and non-communists in the western part. Uh, this would be in um, Poland as well. So Germany would be divided into zones of occupation, the Western Allies taking control over half, the Soviet Union taking control over the east, and they would be there for a certain amount of time to make sure that the government in Germany would be stable before they left, not allowing for another, uh, you know, Nazi regime to be able to rise to power like it did after World War One. Um, again, like I say, uh, also the whole idea of Poland being kind of divided up as well. Uh, the decision was also made at Yalta that the USSR would be allowed to keep its pre-1939 territory, which included the, their parts of Poland. FDR. United States President accepted the Soviet control of Outer Mongolia, the Kuril Islands, and the southern half of the Sakhalin Islands, Port Arthur, and partial operation of the Manchurian Railroads. This was something that Stalin would not budge on. The Soviet Union would need the resources from these Asian territories 
after the war. And ultimately, this sets the stage again for parts of the Cold War that will happen in those Asian territories. The Potsdam Conference was one last conference that happened in July of 1945. Now, at this point, uh, we have some change in people. <laughs> Stalin was still in charge of the Soviet Union, but by this point, um, FDR had died in office, and his um, his vice president, Harry Truman, is now president. And the British prime minister had shifted from Winston Churchill to um, Clement Attlee. So this will change things a little bit. Um, Attlee was not as much of a bulldog, tenacious individual as um, Churchill had been. And Truman was... Um, was a different person than FDR. And so uh, Stalin was hoping that he could get even more at Potsdam. The Allies, however, at Potsdam agreed, all three of them agreed, that they would issue an ultimatum to Japan for unconditional surrender. Because at this point, the war in Europe was over. Uh, the um, Germans had been defeated. The Italians had been defeated. Uh, and all that was left was the Japanese. So they agreed at Potsdam that the Allies would issue an ultimatum for Japan to surrender unconditionally or it would face utter devastation. During the conference, Truman ordered the dropping of the atomic bombs on Japan, recognizing at this point that it would be less costly in American lives to drop the atomic bomb rather than risk a U.S. invasion of Japan. Stalin reversed his position on um, Eastern Europe, saying there would be no free elections. <laughs> After agreeing to free elections at Yalta, he now says at Potsdam, no free elections. And he is forcing this because he sees the um, other two um, leaders of the Allied nations as weaker than the previous two. Approvals were given to the concept of war crimes trials to be held uh, by the Nazi official, uh, of the Nazi officials, I should say, um, that were, that had surrendered, um, that they would be held accountable for the war crimes because by this point, of course, it was recognized what had happened with the Holocaust as those camps were liberated by the Russians in the East and some Americans as well. Um, and this would help for the denazification of Germany. Reparations from Germany could be taken from each respective zone of occupation, the western zones of occupation that were occupied by the, um, basically the, the United States, the British and the French, and of course the eastern territories that were occupied by the Soviet Union. All right, we'll talk more about the implications of all of that uh, in the next lecture of the Cold War. But now let's talk a little bit about the results of World War II. Human losses, about 55 million are dead, including the missing that would never be found. 22 million of that 55 million were from the USSR alone. So they had suffered devastating losses. The Holocaust resulted in deaths of 6 million Jews, as well as 5 to 6 million others. Millions of people that were not killed were, however, left homeless, and millions would have to be relocated because of the devastation to the cities. This especially happened with Germans living outside of Germany. Much of Europe lay in ruins, and it would take years to rebuild Europe economically. Women played an even larger role in the war economy than they had in World War I, and as a result, they would gain more rights after this war as well. The U.S. and the Soviet Union also emerge as the two dominant powers in the post-war world, and of course, they will be the two powers that will eventually have tension 
and the resulting Cold War that happens after uh, the Second World War. The post-war competition for influence in Europe between the U.S. and the Soviet Union, or the West and the Soviet Union, will result in this Cold War that happens after World War II. Why did Germany lose the war? First of all, they were fighting a three-front war. From Russia in the east, France and Italy, the German army was stretched across the entire continent of Europe. They were stretched too thin. Eventually, Germany began running out of soldiers. And we know they were already short on resources from the losses they had suffered after World War I. Ultimately, uh, Germany resorted to using children and older men near the end of the war to fight as soldiers. Major blunders also came into play. The fact that Germany allowed Britain to remain intact after the Battle of Britain, not able to invade Great Britain. The invasion of the Soviet Union and late, the later decision to engage the Soviet army at Stalingrad both proved to be major blunders for the Germans. And Hitler's declaration of war against the U.S. immediately after Pearl Harbor guaranteed the U.S. and Great Britain would focus first on Germany before defeating, defeating Japan. The industrial capacity was not equal to the Allies either because of the losses that Germany already had suffered after World War I. The U.S. outproduced all the Axis powers combined. The Allied bombing of German cities also resulted in destroying many German factories. The German port city of Hamburg was destroyed in the summer of 1943, largely by U.S. aerial assaults. This was a, um, a port city, but it also was a, uh, a producing city, uh, producing of munitions. And by bombing this city, uh, we knocked out some of the German um, capabilities to rearm themselves. Dresden was a um, another uh, major producing city for Germany, and it would be uh, air bombed by the Allies. There was fire bombing in Dresden; it was awful, and it was also a, a big civilian population as well. Um, and this will also help to bring an end to the war. The use of slave labor by the Germans including Slavs and Jews, was not as effective as they hoped it would be. Um, much economic energy in Germany was spent on the final solution for the Jewish population, uh, which ultimately diverted um, funds away from the troops fighting on the front lines. Uh, it cost a lot of money to concentrate the Jews. It even cost a lot of money to, uh, to put them in these death camps and destroy them as well. So these, those were all things that could um, take money and supplies away from the front lines. Germany also did not shift its economy to a total war type of footing until 1943. By that time, the Germans were being severely outproduced. Also, the Axis alliance proved to be a liability for Germany. Italy's failures in places like Greece and Yugoslavia drew Germany into the Balkans region when it should have been focused on the Mediterranean. And that drawing attention away from the Mediterranean allowed for the Battle of El Alamein to be an Allied victory and a German loss. German forces also eventually had to take control over Italy after the Allies began moving up the peninsula and the people of Italy revolted against Mussolini and hung them. The Germans had to take over the region in order to try to save the southern part of Europe from being overrun by the Allies, and of course they will not be able to successfully do so. Mussolini was caught and executed by his own people by 1944. Also, Japan's attack on the U.S. drew Germany into the war against the U.S. So the Axis alliance 
for Germany actually proved to be a liability in the long run. And lastly, the Grand Alliance proved to be overwhelming for Germany. It included the U.S., Great Britain, Russia, and over 40 other countries, if you count how many countries supported it, um, uh, in theory, not just militarily. The alliance worked together to achieve the unconditional surrender of Germany, and ultimately the war will be over. More about the implications of that war as we enter the Cold War in the next lecture.